Welcome back. Good afternoon. Here's our final session of the asteroid observation portion of our program. Uh, again, for people following us online, you can follow us on the chat session at the website www.nasa.gov slash asteroid workshop. Also follow us on hashtag find asteroids. Uh, kick off our next uh, speaker is Jane Liu from MIT Lincoln Labs. She's going to be talking about laser radar for characterization and orbit determination of NEOs. Go ahead, Jane. Oh. Go ahead, Jane. Can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. You're coming through loud and clear. Go ahead, please. NASA's Asteroid Grand Challenge. I can't see my slides, so you actually have to make sure that you guys see what I see. Yeah, that's fine. I show the orbits of all the known potentially hazardous asteroids, numbering about 1,400 as of early this year. The nearest objects are discovered by optical telescopes, and the initial measurements establish the preliminary orbits. But when the optical astrometric arc is only days or weeks long, the orbit is so uncertain that we cannot predict whether the object is on a potentially hazardous lost your audio. Jane, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're cutting in and out. Are you uh, on a landline? Jane? Okay, I tell you what. Jane, we have uh, some technical difficulty. We cannot hear you. Um, I suggest we uh, switch the order and we'll try and sort things out. Um, we'll come back to you, Jane, if we can have uh, Bijan uh, present, and we'll try and sort out the audio issue with you, Jane, and we'll come back to you. But right now, we're going to go to uh, Bijan Namadi from uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, he's going to be speaking to us about measuring the size of NEAs with coherent Doppler radar. So, Jane, again, just uh, we'll come back to you, Jane, once, uh, once we get the technical audio issue resolved. Okay, I will start. The focus of my talk is that class of asteroids that is a, a 10 meter class. These are um, H28 to 30 magnitude um, um, asteroids that are difficult to detect. And I think Jane was about to tell us that once they're detected, they're very hard to keep, keep, track, to keep track of. Uh, almost none of these multi hundred thousand asteroids is, are known. And of the few that have been detected, almost none have been tracked again, because the astrometry on these is too poor. So um, while I'll be talking about the characterization of, of, of these with uh, coherent and actually incoherent LADAR, uh, the prior question is also important of how do we even find them? And if we find them, how do we know where, where to point to? And so those are all parts of this, uh, this talk. And it turns out that the solution that we have um, is adaptable to a single large facility, but aspects of this solution are adaptable to multiple smaller facilities in the detection area. Um, the other thing is that the technology that I'll be talking about is gonna make it possible to observe these, these asteroids over sufficiently long times that we're gonna be able to detect their acceleration and hence their mass and density. The facility, if it was one facility, it would look something like this. It would be a four meter class telescope that could be used to both transmit and receive uh, uh, basically signal, the, the laser uh, signal. An example would be the 3.6 meter AFRL telescope. We are actually, our group is in collaboration with the USAF on an inverse synthetic aperture LIDAR project <coughs> for imaging uh, using uh, a facility like this. And we've been working on this technology for about the last year. The telescope would be augmented with a laser system. The laser system would have a coherent laser uh, that uh, would be uh, one kilowatt class, perhaps working at two microns, and it would be capable of imaging an asteroid of that size. It would uh, have to have a chirp system that can chirp the, uh, the uh, frequency of the laser by as much as uh, tens of gigahertz per second. Uh, the, in, addition, in addition, because of the fact that the, the incoherent lasers are more readily available at higher power and relatively modest cost, uh, um, one could augment this system uh, with a, you know, a large, like a five kilowatt, 
and I think maybe June will tell us about a 10 kilowatt laser, um, perhaps working at NIR, uh, typically one micron, for a range and size determination. Such a facility would need to have adaptive optics. The adaptive optics are necessary to get a diffraction limited transmitter, and you also need in the coherent detection part uh, to, f to match a local oscillator, the phase of the local oscillator with the return from the target, as I'll be talking about in a moment. In addition to all this, you would need an acquisition tracking and astrometry system. This is similar to something that was mentioned earlier, a shift in stack, uh, except that now the, uh, the advent of the new cameras that have been available the past couple of years, uh, such as the EMCCD, but particularly these uh, scientific CMOS cameras that can have high frame rates and low uh, read noise makes a, a really kind of a revolutionary leap uh, possible in uh, acquisition tracking and astrometry of these smallest objects. In addition to that, you would need a graphic processing unit or some other high power computing. It turns out that the commercially available multi thousand dollar GPUs you can buy for um, science or for gaming can do fairly well uh, this, this kind of work, and we've just uh, done some experiments with that. I'll start the, f the first part. Uh, imagine the NEA is coming from a long distance away, 40 lunar distances, one-tenth of an AU away, and you actually have to detect it. We, uh, our shift in stack or shift in add technique, which we call synthetic tracking, that employs a high-speed, uh, low-read noise camera, would uh, be able to detect a, a, an asteroid that is of, of this class of size and uh, to be able to stack the images so that you have, for example, in this image at the bottom, you see um, two, um, let me see if I can use the laser. Uh, you see basically two images. This is a conventional long exposure uh, image of a point, point part of the sky that has an asteroid in it, a 19th magnitude asteroid, which makes this the typical streak. But a shift and add, uh, you know, what we call a synthetically tracked image, uh, we'll, we'll uh, pin that down to almost a resolution element for the telescope. In doing so, a, a, a dramatic difference will occur in the astrometry that's possible. You go, uh, we've demonstrated this year a tenfold improvement of astrometry from uh, approximately 80 milliarc seconds down to sub 7 milliarc seconds, and we think we could do better. Um, of, of the astro and that would be sufficient then to keep track of this. Of course, that's relative differential astrometry. To get absolute astrometry, we would piggyback on, for example, a, a astrometric survey mission like Gaia, which is uh, being launched from Europe uh, by the Europeans next month. Um, and, and Gaia, within a couple of years, will have everything brighter than 20th magnitude down to 100 microarc seconds, and we'd be fully capable of uh, augmenting um, what we do with that. OK, going to the laser range, um, basically, uh, as, as the asteroid gets closer, and let's say it's at about 12 lunar distances, now a high power laser can be used. Um, and the high power lasers right now are, are easy and easier and cheaper to get in the incoherent mode. And if it's incoherent, then you would want to, our solution anyway, is to do an amplitude modulation uh, of, the, um, of the laser. And uh, you can operate in two modes. If you use a single, ampl single amplitude modulated frequency, you can get the radial velocity. Once you know that, you can chirp the ang angular, uh, amplitude modulation to get the range inside. You would just look for a drop. As you go from a long wavelengths to shorter wavelengths, you look for when suddenly the modulation uh, level drops. And that's, you know, I come from an interferometry background. We call that fringe visibility. And so when the visibility drops to a half, you've, you've hit the top, the, the, you've, you're now sensing the object's size. OK, that's the incoherent, but, more, but the title of my talk was coherent. So let's talk about coherent. This is also known, a, known as inverse synthetic aperture LIDAR, or LADAR. It's also known as long-range imaging LIDAR. And it's basically the um, uh, optical equivalent of uh, synthetic aperture radar. And in this case, I, oh, and it's also known as range and Doppler imaging, of course. And so in this case, what you do is you send a chirp laser beam with your telescope. The, the telescope basically narrows the beam down so that it's, there's enough power on the target. You collect the return from the target, which now is extremely, extremely faint uh, amount of light. But now with the coherent imaging, you can mix with a local oscillator. That can give you as much as easily eight orders of magnitude of gain 
so that you can now get a very good detectable signal. So that in, in this w regime, we wouldn't need a quantum limited uh, detector, whereas in coherent, uh, incoherent we would. Okay, and uh, so this can be analyzed, and uh, from that we can determine the um, we can determine the imaging. We've done some calculations on what we can do with such a system. Out to 40 lunar distances, we can detect a 10 meter NEO with a telescope like this in less than two minutes. Uh, LADAR ranging, uh, there's a table that shows you can go from 25% size error down to 1% size error at two lunar distances. So as it approaches closer and closer, you can uh, image it better. And then in imaging, we have refined that we can get an SNR of 10 in each pixel of a 5 by 5 pixel image of this. And the final, uh, and, and also the acceleration gives us mass, and I can go over that in the, if, if there's a question about that, but that's also available because synthetic tracking allows you to see it for so long. Over five weeks, there's enough uh, motion that that's astrometrically now visible, and now we can get the, 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 the mass. Finally, this stuff is actually being put together in the lab, and uh, so uh, we are expecting to be able to report results soon. Thank you, uh, Bijan. Okay, uh, any uh, questions about this uh, in the room? Okay, no questions? Uh, I did have one question, unless Paul, you had one. Well, my question is, is uh, what's the time scale for this? How far in the future is this? Um, we are, we have really had first light uh, we expect to have range Doppler images within um, within a half a year. We should have full range Doppler in the lab at JPL. And next this year, actually, in this fiscal year, our plan is to go out and do a field demonstration. And then with our partners at uh, AFRL, we're hoping to actually go on their telescope and, and actually the range an object in the sky. So, yeah. Okay, good. Impressive. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Well, this is Lindley. Uh, yeah. You use the word detect. Um, don't you need to have uh, an orbital... Uh, uh, a pretty good orbit set to begin with? Well, the idea would be to detect it for the first time. So you're scanning the sky, and the telescope has the <laughs> sensitivity with synthetic tracking to actually observe it for the very first time. And when you observe it, then you can immediately start a, a regime of astrometry so that you can see it the next night, and on a logarithmic basis of time, you can detect it then within, you know, a, a week later, you'll see it. And by the time you've seen it for over the four weeks that you could see such a thing, or three weeks, depending on the case, uh, you have enough astrometry to see it at the next apparition. So you will never lose that again. Okay, so you believe you can get enough of a return to actually do the initial detection? Yeah. Yeah, we are, uh, we are um, experimenting right now uh, with, uh, you know, we're almost at a photon limited regime in the lab and we're going to try to demonstrate that this year to make sure that that's, that's reality. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, if we can go back to Jane. Jane, are, can you hear us now? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, let's, uh, if, sorry about the technical difficulties, if we could um, try your presentation again, and um, we'll begin when you are ready. Okay, go, go ahead, Jane. So I'm on slide uh, number three, which says astrometric capability. Yeah, we're with you. So um, range measurement, uh, before uh, I was talking about how, how large orbit uncertainties mean that uh, we most likely will... Uh, hey, Jane, uh, we can't hear you. Can you uh, try again? Yeah, can you, Better? hello, can you try again? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Please keep um, talking. Are you on a speakerphone or something? You might have to go to a handset. Hey, Jane, we, we, we can't hear you again. Uh, can you try one more time? Okay. Um, I think we're going to have to, Jane, we'll come back to you again. Uh, we're going to have to uh, move on. So, Jane, just stand by again while we try and work out the uh, difficulties. Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Stefan Kleen. 
Uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, use of star trackers uh, from existing satellite missions to measure light variation due to the rotation of asteroids. And when Stephen is ready, we'll begin. Hello. Yes, it's Stephen Clean here. I'm talking about uh, existing high resolution satellites. They have star trackers on them, and over half their mission, they have nothing to do. So um, I'm going to go over a few topics, uh, give a little background on star trackers, a little feedback too, uh, description of operation. We just asked. Yeah, <laughs> advantages, um, and some recommended actions. Here's an example. Uh, star tracker with a light shade. It has uh, optics inside, CCD, and computation unit. So <clears throat> high-resolution Earth-observing satellites, like what take images that you see on Google Earth, need accurate attitude position. That's what they use the star trackers for. They precisely measure the position and magnitude of stars for input to the attitude control system. And there's a precedence for reusing star trackers uh, for other missions. NASA's WIRE spacecraft uh, did that, and they successfully uh, measured uh, s uh, stars was their mission. Uh, <clears throat> typical star tracker uh, software can be changed on orbit after it's up there. We've uh, done that, worked on systems. Um, <clears throat> this one challenge we have is the magnitude of what they're what they're looking at. Currently, they're designed for a very fast update, um, and they do change what at magnitude that they're looking at, and they adjust their hertz rate. So our challenge would be to going down um, to a low, um, uh, low sample rate, a long exposure to get at magnitudes that we're, we're looking for. But um, a little bit more on the operation. So uh, the Earth-observing satellites are in a sun-synchronous uh, orbit, and um, here's an orbit. And so half the time you're in the dark, and you don't have anything to do. So it's a good time to look for asteroids. So the satellites and the operations are set up to respond rapidly. So um, they can, you can change the uplink of what they're tasking 10 minutes before it comes into view. Typically, <coughs> you do it like two hours b before. So if the uh, asteroids comes in, you could, you could get uh, into it fairly quickly if it's, if it's within range for the spacecraft. And it, uh, at this altitude, the spacecraft orbits every hour and a half. So you can get an, another access, and you, so you can get repeated access, or you can use multiple satellites and get uh, continuous access, providing the moon or other things aren't in the way. So the operation would be to aim one of the star trackers at the potential asteroid and take the measurements. Um, in addition to lengthening exposure time, we could look at um, image stacking, as was talked about on other presentations. Um, the advantages of space, and people know this, you uh, get rid of the variation due to lower Earth atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> access time is pretty predictable because you, you don't have to worry about the clouds not being in the, being in the way. And um, <clears throat> if, you're, if we use sensors that have been up there for a while, the star tracker sensors are very stabilized and uh, their characteristics are pretty well known. Um, also, this shouldn't impact the spacecraft's operation. Uh, the power budget, um, the star trackers are, are typically left on through the whole orbit. Um, so the main mission here would be, once you find some asteroids, um, to measure the light curves, because you can do repeated uh, op um, sense uh, measurements on those. Uh, it would be relatively low cost to uh, some other things because assets currently in space and you're doing a cost share with the infrastructure because of the main mission as the ground station and personnel to maintain it um, and the communication links so so one thing to do is uh, take inventory of what uh, star trackers are out there determine the best candidates 
come up with a test operation using ground-based test units to upload the software. Um, <clears throat> in addition to this tracking software, there could be some tasking software that would need to be upgraded on the ground system. And then you can test it with some fate objects until something comes into view. And with that, I can take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, any questions from in the room? Any, um, Lindley, anything? Oh, we did have one, sorry, go ahead. When the uh, satellite is on the back side of the Earth in the shadow, are there typically any activities going on that would keep you from using the star tracker, meaning you can't turn it or move it or the operator is engaged and so they couldn't process? Yeah, but for most of the satellites, um, that wouldn't be. Um, an issue. Sometimes they're, we're doing downlinks, but the, typically the high gain antenna is a gimbaled antenna, and um, we do normal imaging and downlink at the same time. So you could do that. Is aiming the Star Tracker expensive? I mean, does, is there a fuel cost or energy cost? It, there's a there's a little bit of energy cost of running the reaction wheels, but you're going to be running the reaction wheels anyway to keep yourself in it. So you. There is some, there is some, but uh, it's relatively low. We've, um, actually we do some with the main telescope, at night operations um, for calibration, but that, that we have to start watching the power budget. One quick question on, uh, well, field of view was one question. Yeah. And part B is how far can you push the magnitudes? How, how well, faint can we go? Okay, so field of view I can answer. Yeah. Um, typical range is eight degrees, eight by eight okay. degrees. Um, and how far is that's the big challenge here. <laughs> right. So. Do you have any kind of estimate on limiting magnitude? I mean, that was my question too. Yeah, yeah that's uh, TBD. 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 Okay. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thanks. Okay. Um, we will try and go back to Jane. Yep, One more I'm time. here. All right. Third, okay, sorry about that. Third time lucky. Uh, okay, so uh, I hope my slides are showing, and um, I'll just start with slide three, um, where I'm addressing the problem of uh, large orbit uncertainties. Uh, so range measurements can drastically reduce the uncertainty of an asteroid orbit. So this table on uh, slide three shows the ability of different techniques to measure range and angle position. Radar can measure the range of a target very accurately, with about 10 meter accuracy. But due to its very large beam, radar is not very good at angle measurement. In contrast, traditional astrometry, which is passive optical measurement, is poor at measuring range, but it's much better at locating the target's ang angular position with an accuracy of about one arc second. But there is one third technique that combines the best of both radar and passive optical measurement, and that's laser radar. So next slide, laser radar versus radar. So as its name implies, laser radar combines radar and optical wavelengths. It involves sending a beam to the asteroid and detecting the reflected, si reflected signal. But whereas radar uses radio wavelengths, laser radar's wavelength lies in the optical or the infrared. Um, the first solar system object beyond Earth to be observed with ra laser radar was the moon, and this was done back in 1962. But cur current laser radar technology is capable of going much further than the moon. Uh, we believe we have enough laser power and good enough detectors to probe asteroids all the way from the near-Earth region all the way to the Jupiter region. Laser radar's advantage lies in its relatively short wavelength. Now remember that the diffraction limit of any telescope, whether sending or receiving light, is lambda over d, where lambda is a wavelength and d is a telescope diameter. For Arecibo, la lambda is 12 centimeters. For laser radar, lambda is one micron. So that is five orders of magnitude, smaller than radar's wavelength. A radar telescope admittedly is much larger than an optical telescope, but only about one order of magnitude, and that's not enough to make up for the wavelength ratio. So as a result, lambda over d is much smaller for laser radar, which means the laser beam diffracts much more slowly than the radar beam. And since the laser beam diffracts more slowly, is relatively small when it reaches the asteroid and thus produces much, a much more intense beam on the target. So depending on the size of the asteroid, the laser beam can be even smaller than the asteroid itself, in which case the entire laser beam is intercepted and reflected by the asteroid with no wasted power, as indicated by the drawing on the, the lower right. So in this situation, the laser radar signal scales as one of r squared, 
where R is a distance to the asteroid. In contrast, if you look on the, the left drawing, the radar signal to noise always scales 1 over R to the fourth. And that is why radar can only observe asteroids that come really close. So next slide. The laser radar system we envision includes two large telescopes in the 10-meter class, one to transmit and one to receive the laser beam. The transmit telescope needs adaptive optics because we want the transmit beam to be as close to diffraction limited as possible in order to maximize the power on, on the asteroid. The re requirement of the receive telescope is much less stringent. Its job is simply to be a photon bucket, just count the number of returned photons. And since there's no imaging involved, the receiving telescope can just be one big telescope or a bunch of smaller telescopes. The laser would be a 20 kilowatt ethereum-based cryogenic laser. Um, material properties like thermal conductivity and refractive index are much better at low temperature. So cryogenic lasers can produce high power efficiently with near ideal uh, beam quality. The spectral line width of such a laser is also very narrow, allowing the use of very narrow band filter to minimize uh, background light. Cryogenic laser technology is well established, and 20 kilowatt is well within the capability of current technology. For the detector, we would use a type of low-noise photon counters called superconducting nanowires, which are cryogenically cooled below 4 Kelvin. These detectors have a high quantum efficiency and very low dark counts. All the main components of this system, the cryogenic laser, the superconducting nanowires, and adaptive optics are areas of expertise here at Lincoln Lab, so we're confident that we can build these components. Uh, next slide. Now this slide should say laser radar capability in the Earth region. This plot shows the expected performance of a laser radar system compared to Arecibo and Goldstone. So the blue line, the blue curve is laser radar, the red curve is Arecibo, and the green curve is Goldstone. The y-axis is the geocentric distance in AU, and the x-axis is the diameter of the asteroid in meter. So this plot answers the question, how far out can an asteroid be detected at a signal-to-noise ratio of three? And the assumptions are, are stated at the top of, uh, of, of the slide. So the plot shows that um, if you look at the one, one kilometer size, that laser radar can observe, can see a one kilometer object as far out as about 0.7 AU, about a factor of two further than Arecibo. The, the drawing to the right of the plot illustrates what laser radar can do. So it shows an entire asteroid illuminated by the, the laser beam. The photons coming back will have different arrival times because they're reflected from different parts of the asteroid. The photons hitting the front edge will come back earlier than the photons hitting the, the back edge. So the photon arrival times not only tell us how far away the asteroid is, but also something about the asteroid shape. And as the asteroid rotates, we can probe its other dimensions. The resolution of these shape measurements depends um, on the signal to noise. And in theory, it can be as good as 20 meters. And this kind of resolution can be, can be matched only by, by radar and space missions. But laser radar can reach many more objects than both of those techniques. And finally, combining the size information with the range, we can calculate the asteroid albedo, which tells us something about its surface composition. Okay, next slide. Now, this should say probing inner solar system with laser radar. So this plot is similar to the plot you saw uh, on the earlier slide, but now the y-axis extends all the way up to 6 AU, and the asteroid side range is now 1 kilometer to 100 kilometer on the x-axis. So we can see that laser radar can observe a 10-kilometer object as far out as the main asteroid belt. 100-kilometer-sized objects can be seen even beyond Jupiter's distance. So this includes large Trojan asteroids as well as uh, several of Jupiter's regular satellites. Okay, so next slide. Here I'll just uh, summarize the benefits of a dedicated laser radar system. A dedicated laser radar system can guarantee the recovery of newly discovered objects, which would be a welcome help to Arecibo and Goldstone, who are already heavily oversubscribed. Um, laser radar's main benefit is the sensitivity to a wide range of asteroid sizes over a large distance range. It can yield range, size, optical albedo. And this table shows the cost of a full capability prototype um, to be used on existing telescopes and uh, it lists the, the cost of the main components, right? the, the laser, the detector, the adaptive optics. And the, so the total cost is on the order of 24 million spread out about three, over three years. Jane, you have one minute, please. Yep. So in summary, um, laser radar technology is advanced enough to probe essentially the entire inner solar system. A dedicated laser radar system basically opens up a brand new way to, to look at solar system objects. 
It can refine orbit for impact forecasting, space missions, and it can provide uh, shape information, size, and surface composition for a wide range of objects. And the technology already exists. It just remains to be put together. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kenny, any comments and uh, questions in the room? We have one. Some, the chart that you put this just before the summary talked about with the existing telescope. This again is the is a 10 meter class telescope. Yes, it is. Um, I'm referring to you. Uh, the, yeah, I'm referring to existing 10 meter telescope by the Keck. Okay. Any other questions in the room? We have one more. Real stupid one. Um, can we we can we can aim a laser beam at a asteroid in the main asteroid belt and actually hit it? I'm so just the question is, can we aim a laser beam at yeah, an can, asteroid in the main belt That's and amazing. hit it? amazing. We can do that. I, just, uh, cool. I, I believe we can because um, and even though um, our, the laser beam is much smaller than the radar beam, but it still it depends on the asteroid size. Um, if the asteroid size is smaller than, than the, the laser beam, that's, it should be no problem at all. Wow. All right, thank you. I think, uh, do we have another one? One in the, one in the back, last question. Hi, Jane. Is it possible to make the laser beam broader? Because you, you were saying you know, it's a six kilometer diameter laser beam at 0.1 AU, and there's very few near Earth asteroids that we have positions as well as six kilometers. So would there be a way to say broaden the beam to a couple hundred kilometers to initially find it and then home in once you found it? Um, sure, it's, it's easy to make a beam broad, broad. You just don't, you know, it's um, it's limited. Without adaptive optic, it's a seeing that limits the size of the beam. I so mean, yeah, if, you want a, a, yeah. if you want a broad beam, just take away adaptive optics. But then you really decrease the um, the intensity on on the asteroid. So um, typically, just, there's, that, so, there's that, so few near Earth asteroids that we have their positions down to six kilometers. In fact, I see. I think there may um, only be one. <laughs> Right. So uh, yes, we can do that. So we can spread out the beam to uh, to to locate the object, and then then um, turn on the ad adaptive optics once you have the, the, the a, a good position for it. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think we have to move on to the next talk. Uh, the next talk is by uh, Chris Lewicki for Planetary Resources, leveraging Planetary Resources network of ARCID 100 space telescopes to be launched in 2015. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy to be here today working with NASA and the Asteroid Initiative and uh, looking at all the options uh, for exploring the asteroids. We're particularly interested in uh, those activities uh, which we might work together on creating infrastructure and especially identifying and characterizing asteroids which may be of potential future resource use, whether that resources are for future human use in NASA exploration missions or even commercial missions. So to summarize really my comments up front, uh, Planetary Resources is working on ultra low cost, really off the shelf derived capability to go out and explore uh, and characterize and identify the resources on asteroids. And in 2015, we'll begin with a demonstration of a prototype of that capability in low Earth orbit. And that affords some opportunities to use that platform and actually a network of spacecraft uh, to perform, while we're up there, some asteroid characterization op uh, observations. Uh, there are things that we'll be doing, uh, both from a technology standpoint, which have nothing to do with the, the observation, uh, and then while we are up there with an optic and a sensor, we can, of course, uh, use that sensor uh, to be part of the network of all the different resources that we have that can increase uh, the global knowledge of NEOs. So this is part of a program, and it's not a single mission, it's an evolution of missions. And the goal is to create a capability uh, that is commercially viable to go out and prospect and understand uh, as many near-Earth objects as we possibly can. Uh, we've uh, just been to two so far. Uh, by the end of the decade, uh, we'll be to four. If uh, we go through with ARM, that will be five. Uh, and that's a good start. Uh, but uh, from a commercial standpoint, we're going to have to do much, much more. Uh, so we're looking at a program where we actually 
culminate in the swarm exploration of multiple near-Earth uh, asteroids and uh, ways as we're getting to that where we can essentially risk reduce and demonstrate that capability in places like low Earth orbit. The focal point of that in the near term uh, with an instrument capability is what we call the ARCID-100. It's our first instrument in space. This is the size of the spacecraft and the class of spacecraft that we would like to get out to a near-Earth asteroid. Once you take off all the propulsion uh, and everything that you need to inject it into an orbit, you end up, if you're using secondary launches, with only about 15 kilograms of uh, payload. Uh, and that is a, a fairly tiny package, and uh, as a result of that, we want to put as much glass and as much optic as possible. Uh, so we have a 20 centimeter uh, RC optic with a resolving capability of about an arc second, and through stabilization and other techniques, uh, we can get down to uh, sensitivities of about VMAG 19. Um, and really just a broad range using an industrial CCD of uh, doing imaging and photometric measurements uh, and using uh, filters we can get uh, spectral characteristics to help bin uh, things and either uh, bring things into consideration or rule things out of consider consideration. And on the bottom there you can see a full size configuration prototype uh, with me for reference uh, on about how, object these are, uh, how large these objects are. So we're putting a couple of these into orbit starting in 2015. Um, there are of course a number of advantages for having things in space here up above weather, up above the atmosphere. Uh, you effectively have a larger optic because of those advantages. Uh, also, you have the advantages not just because we have a small constellation of a few of these, uh, but the dwell time that you can have on target can be longer. Your ability to respond to a wider range of spots in the sky uh, is, is possible. Um, and really uh, what I see the, uh, with the ARCID-100 as playing a niche role of uh, being able to do very rapid follow-up with things that are found by much larger scopes, being able to spend the time to get a photometric study of them, to get light curves, uh, and then uh, where possible uh, get uh, even better than that and uh, uh, start to characterize these things by uh, their resource potential. Um, if I get the opportunity to speak tomorrow, I'll give a quick plug for it today. Part of the thing that we're going to use for these test beds uh, in space is essentially data mining and algorithms. And we've started a project with the Zooniverse, uh, partnered with the Catalina Sky Survey, and with the great support of uh, Tim Spar at the Minor Planet Center and lots of advice from NASA, of essentially crowdsourcing uh, the ability and seeing how good our algorithms are, and then also working with NASA and turning those into algorithm competitions. And the whole idea behind this for planetary resources interests are uh, a rising tide lifts all boats. The more objects that we can find, the better for everyone. Uh, the better we can characterize these uh, uh, objects in space, uh, the better it makes our resource targets. And if we can put these algorithms actually on the spacecraft, which we would like to do with the ARC-100, uh, we can eliminate or greatly reduce our dependence on the data pipeline uh, between here and Earth, giving us the option of putting those spacecraft out at uh, uh, distant points from Earth out at the Lagrange points. Uh, so if we get the opportunity to present tomorrow, you'll hear more about that then. We're starting next year. Uh, with a demonstration of hardware in orbit uh, and from software uh, and technology and imaging stuff, we'll test out some of this on essentially taking the back end of the ARCID-100, which is the avionics section, and uh, cramming all that stuff into a 3U CubeSat and deploying it uh, via NanoRack service from the International Space Station uh, through a crew resupply mission. And on this mission, we'll have the opportunity essentially to test out all these uh, commercial and really low cost approaches that allow us to consider asteroid rendezvous missions that can be measured in the uh, millions, uh, you know, as much as maybe only $10 million for going out and doing uh, asteroid rendezvous missions. Uh, and admittedly higher at risk, but uh, essentially uh, pushing the envelope forward and, uh, and uh, making this a commercially viable proposition. Uh, so to close on things and looking at uh, in terms of uh, private-public partnerships and NASA leveraging uh, things that are happening at planetary resources, uh, we see low Earth orbit as really a proving grounds and a testing grounds of testing out technology and the ability to uh, have that as part of the portfolio uh, to be able to deploy instruments to test technology to have things where we can do space-based sensing, uh, get access to broader ranges of spectrum, and have this be part of the overall monitoring network. I think this is something that uh, can help very much with the identification, identification of targets and uh, bringing those orbit condition codes down for uh, all the very uncertain uh, orbital parameters of asteroids that are out there. Uh, so uh, for data that we produce for ourselves, uh, data that we post for the public through uh, programs that we've started through our ARCID Kickstarter campaign, 
uh, and data that we may produce for the government or scientific customers. There's op op opportunities essentially to create purpose-built observations where we can go out and get uh, very specific um, types of observations that we can enable in a very uh, rapid turnaround. These are types of things where secondary launches are available uh, several times a year and the ability to put up a new instrument to pose a new observation uh, and get that into space is something that uh, can be measured in uh, you know, certainly uh, uh, less than two years uh, to be able to turn these things around. So whether it's uh, uh, dedicated explorers class missions or, um, or leveraging the spare time on uh, what we'll be doing for commercial observations, I think there's lots of opportunity there. The last thing I'd like to say is there is a lot of unused capacity that's going into space in the form of ballast or unused rideshare opportunities. And Planetary Resources is very interested in all opportunities that are going to space, especially those that are going Earth escape. And to be able to take one of these scopes and put it on a trajectory that is leaving the Earth, wherever that might be, uh, is something that we would certainly be interested in working with NASA or whomever and taking advantage of those opportunities and not letting any launch opportunity go unused. Thank you very much. Okay, we have uh, time for some questions. Is there any in the room? Yes, uh, for this network, how many of these six U telescopes do you need to cover the majority of the sky? And again, the magnitude question, how far can you go? Yeah, so our, our objective isn't to a, a cover a majority of the sky. We're putting up uh, three telescopes, the first going in 2015, the next one's probably following in a pair of launches in 2016. <coughs> Uh, and for us, the goal is actually to start prototyping our swarm exploration strategy at a near-Earth asteroid. So uh, the, because they are secondary launches, they may or may not end up being in complementary planes. Uh, but it's the type of thing in terms of being able to see a portion of the sky and have a revisit, on that, revisit time on that that's measured in 45 minutes. So if you have a monsoon or if you have bad weather or if you're in the middle of a lunation, uh, these are types of things where while the rest of the planet is mooned out, so to speak, uh, we have two or three days where uh, we can essentially be uh, one of the things that will still be able to operate uh, while, uh, while that's taking place. And as I said in the presentation, we're bound to about 19th magnitude with typical integrations on what you do with a, um, a cadence of observation anywhere between 10 and 20 second integration times. Okay. Any other questions uh, from the room? Okay. If not, let's move on. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, speaker comes to us virtually. This is uh, David Rabanis from Space Apps Chile. This is a CubeSat swarm with IR sensors and onboard <laughs> data processing. So David, um, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, we are very grateful that we have, uh, that our proposal has been selected uh, for this presentation at the NASA Asteroid Observation Session. Uh, we started out in earlier this year in April in the Space Apps Challenge that was called by NASA. We participated in Chile, and our team, Carlos, Rodolfo, Eric, Anton, and myself, David, uh, we have participated in this, and we tackled asteroid hunting. And we found, uh, do I switch myself to page two? Do you see that? Um, okay, so we, we tackled the um, challenge, which was to develop a mission concept for exploration of Apophis. That's one of the um, asteroids that is supposed to be having a close encounter in 2029. And uh, given, given the da damage that um, asteroids can produce, we thought it would be much more sensible to think of the many more that we need to be actually tracked and, and uh, observed. So we, um, I switched to page three. Tagging and tracking only of one asteroid in this challenge uh, was uh, really not so much of a meaningful thing if there are more than 100,000 unknown objects that could potentially can as well pose a risk. So we thought it, we focus more on how to predict the forces that act on an asteroid. That means we have to track the environment around them and this environment around them means all the little masses that pull and tug on them. And that need, means we have to have a very complete picture of the asteroid belt. So basically, this is what we uh, then tried to do in this challenge. And we wanted to uh, 
pro propose a mission concept to map entirely down to a certain to be si decided size the, the asteroid belt. Uh, page four. So we, we think uh, we should do this in three in three phases. It, in, in general, it's a public learning project. Ground-based technology testing, of course, needs to be done first. Um, that's one of the first uh, phases. The second is massivation of ground-based hardware and operations. That means actually to put it on many more shoulders, crowdsourcing uh, technology and also um, bringing many more people into, into, the, uh, into the game. This is also being um, presented in some other talks talks, uh, I think, tomorrow um, in the citizen science part. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as, as, as our outcome from our asteroid space apps challenge uh, mission concept was a concept for space-based systems that would be a swarm of CubeSats potentially at, uh, at the L2, Lagrange 2 point of Mars to map, to be closer to the asteroid belt. Uh, to have better signal. Uh, next page. So the first phase would be ground-based technology testing. Here I have uh, shown a near-infrared to thermal-infrared transmission plot, and there's four prime frequency or wavelength ranges that I would like to ob observe with, uh, with a um, telescope, and that allows us to discern the surface temperature of a asteroid or a planet from the, the background stars. So that would be actually uh, basically probing the black body or gray body spectrum of the object, which is uh, more um, significant than the optical reflection of these uh, objects. So basically we need accessibility uh, of this technology to amateurs, that means infrared sensors in that wavelength range moderately cooled thermal infrared sensors, narrowband filters, and robotic telescopes. I switch to page six. The phase two would be the massivation of this hardware. Uh, and that needs to be done by crowdfunded uh, campaigns to buy the bulk, purchase infrared sensors, narrowband filters, cooling technology, telescope motion control, which is actually already pretty uh, much available, but not, not accessible enough uh, for, for my taste open source control software exits already, and so on. So we need basically involve the amateur, uh, the amateur communities in, in this. And of course, outreach campaigns at schools and colleges and so on are part of it. And especially in Chile, the Atacama um, provides a very good uh, place to do it from the ground because it's very dry, so these uh, transmissions um, uh, in the infrared are, uh, are, are, are very good. So we have very little losses in the atmosphere. And then, of course, we need to develop the image stacking and feature detection routines, which in optical infrared astronomy already exist. Maybe they just have to be ported. And uh, as a second step, in, in the, as, as one of the last steps in this uh, uh, phase, there would be technology refinement for nanosats. That means mini mini miniaturization. And my personal wish would be to extend this infrared range up to 18 microns, which is a little bit of a challenge, of course. Uh, phase three would then be to go for space-based observations. That means launch and operate a prototype in low Earth orbit, and later on designing the swarm that goes to the Lagrange orbit. And uh, we would like to hitch a ride to Mars as one of the ballast loads that has been announced by NASA as well. Uh, my predecessor uh, in this talk also mentioned it, which is a very nice opportunity to, to get uh, far away from Earth. And we think of a swarm of six to 10 copies, maybe 12 or so, uh, that minimizes the risk. And it would have to, I mean, uh, uh, we would need to have miniaturized ion thrusters to propulse us to L2, power, of course, from solar panels and so on. So, so many of these technologies are already in the, in the process of being um, developed, and we personally would like to just focus on the, uh, on the new payload, which is this infrared various narrowband detection schemes. And we would like to engage radio amateur community for data downlinks, uh, which also is a necessity to get the data. 
Um, the flight configuration would be uh, uh, like in this picture, page eight, uh, basically a telescope, uh, which is a round telescope, deployable, obviously, from, from this uh, CubeSat, pointing to, towards the uh, main asteroid belt, and the other side uh, uh, pointing to the sun. Uh, that would be the normal flight configuration. The scanning would be a rotating uh, spiral on the ecliptic plane, so every image frame would be reobserved various times that allows us to stack the, the images and uh, decrease the noise. And we just uh, let time work for us and reobserve patterns on sky to, to reduce the noise. Basically, that's the, the idea. And with this whole challenge, we would um, actually ha have some synergies with other space app challenges that have been uh, uh, formulated by NASA that is the, d the database for near-Earth objects, CubeSat for asteroid exploration, ArduSat, Hydrate to Mars, and Why We Explore. These are the, the main themes that uh, have connections with this, what we, what we want to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, any, any uh, questions from one in the room? This paper? We have uh, one question, David. S David, what is the focus on 18 micrometers? Why specifically that band? 18 micrometers um, al allows you to have the highest possible signal if you have an object that has only 100 kelvins of, of, of uh, surface temperature, so 120 or so. It's the peak radiation of the black body, uh, the black body curve. So, so it allows you to probe the whole temperature range better. Do you know the answer? It, it, I, I, I don't think it is a necessity, but I think it's a, it's a good um, frequency or wavelength that, that allows you to, to really uh, probe cold objects in our, in our uh, uh, solar system. Uh, one more quick question: Why, um, why go? Why are we observing the asteroid belt from Mars? Would it be possible to do this from the Earth L2 point? It would be possible from the Earth as well, but we think that since we have only a CubeSat and only maybe a 20 centimeter size telescope, we would like to go to uh, to the site beyond Mars because we are halfway to the asteroid belt. That means we half the distance, so we have four times more of a signal. So we can probe more uh, complete the, the smaller objects. Or as a, down, as, as a compromise, we don't need the very high top-notch um, sensitivities of, of detectors that uh, are available today. Um, so, so, you know, it's, it's a compromise, of course. Okay. But I think getting closer to the, to the belt uh, uh, always gives you the, the square of the distance uh, in, in gain in, in, in signal that relaxes your requirements on the sensitivity of the detector, which is actually the, the most benefit I can see. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Move on to the uh, next and uh, last presentation of the session. Uh, session. Uh, this is Rick Tumlinson from Deep Space Industries. He's gonna be talking to us about scouting missions that are required to characterize potential asteroid targets. Hi there, I'm, uh, my name is Rick. I am not a scientist or an engineer, although they let me hang around. Um, I am gonna be presenting for the company. I am speaking for uh, the folks in the company, um, unless the uh, things I say sound stupid, in which case it's probably coming from me, not Dr. Dr. John Lewis or Dr. Mark Saunter or many of the others who are involved in our company. Uh, there are probably about 20 of us right now in the company. Um, this is the original plan, uh, you know, uh, asteroid redirect. This, was, this is the way we would love it all to be. Uh, big asteroid, lots of things going on, getting out there. Um, this is where we are right now. Uh, I don't think this one's gonna happen either. Um, uh, when it gets wrapped up, I call it the Jiffy Pop mission. Um, I think it's, uh, it's important. I think these are great ideas. I just don't necessarily think that's the way we're gonna go sending out a very large and expensive mission to grab a small rock. Um, now, we went down the same path in our company, which was a small mission to grab a small rock, um, and we began to investigate what was involved with that, and we began to change our plans. 
And we are finding a lot more um, new Earth objects out there, and it's getting very, very interesting. Um, unfortunately, we don't know a lot about them. We can do a lot, as you've heard early in the session, um, as far as ground-based observation, et cetera, to learn what they are. But basically, um, you know, when you get out to, certain, to the smaller sizes, you really don't know a lot about what's going on with them. We don't know whether they're solid, whether they're gravel piles, et cetera, and all of this begins to make a lot of difference, especially when you get out there. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the movie Spinal Tap, but if, in, that, uh, in that movie, they had planned on a gigantic model of Stonehenge coming to their stage. They were, it was supposed to be 18 feet high. Of course, they uh, didn't do a lot of pre-planning, so what actually showed up on the stage was 18 inches high. It can be rather embarrassing if we send our astronauts out to something that we haven't really checked out in detail before we get there. So we need to find out what they are. Are they solid? Are they not solid? Now, we have a lot of opportunities to do so. We actually see some very interesting periods where we can get into some scouting missions and get out there in advance and start finding out what they are made of before we start mounting very expensive missions. These are various periods where we could actually send out small scouts to do different sorts of scouting missions. There are different kinds of scouting missions, which are basically visual, involving flybys, there's rendezvous where you actually loiter and, uh, in a sense, orbit around the, the actual object, um, and then you can actually get to the sample return. We have uh, different classes of vehicles that we're looking at in our, in our company that are being designed and missions are being laid out for. There are the fireflies, which are flyby missions. They're fast, they're low cost, they're fast to target, they're repeatable. We have the firefly, the gnats, which is something that you know, keeps flying around your head. Basically, it's a rendezvous mission, which would loiter long-term around an object. Um, there's the mother ships, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then there's sample return, which are dragonflies. Firefly scouts, small, 6 to 12 U. Uh, we build them in threes. That's how we reduce uh, our uh, risk. Uh, we'll fly them on different vehicles. We believe we could fly, build and fly three of these for under $20 million and probably have them in, uh, in the air, so to speak, uh, within two years. Of, of funding. Dragonflies, uh, 10 to 50 kilogram sample return. Everything we do in our company, we do in threes. That is our clever risk reduction method. Uh, and you don't fly the second and third ones until the first one um, has made it through your, you know, your most uh, risk, high risk period of flight. Um, we believe we could do 10 kilogram dragonfly uh, asteroid missions uh, for under $50 million. Uh, then there's the mothership carrier, which is being unveiled right now here for the first time. And this is one that gets into sort of the grand challenge. The idea here is to carry a large number of small 3, 6, 12 U CubeSats or a large swarm of, of small chipsats into space. Now, we have to do this in a new way. I'm using the term the new NEO initiative. Uh, whatever comes out of what it is that's being worked on now is going to be something that's better than what we had. And that's what I'm excited about. We want to be able to deliver space science, industrial science, and planetary defense knowledge. We believe that we have to create the infrastructure and leave the infrastructure behind so that we can get out there and start doing things with the things that we discover. Remember, there's the threat and the promise. We believe that the models that work and are working today in LEO are the COTS model and then the ILDD model, which is being used with the Google Lunar X Prize. The COTS model is working today. There was a commercial launch of a SpaceX vehicle which carried a commercial vehicle into space, which was derived from a partnership with NASA and the US government to develop that vehicle. At the same time, there was another vehicle that docked with or burst with the space station and deliver goods to the government employees in the government space facility at a very much reduced cost that will begin to develop an Earth to LEO infrastructure that can be used for all for the benefit of all. We need to have a new relationship. Actually, somebody reminded me this is actually the old relationship, the NACA relationship, which predates NASA, relationship to the aerospace industry beyond LEO. The agency, we would like to see specify the needs, provide the tech development support, purchase data and information, and the private sector can develop the technology, operate the projects, and deliver that data and information to the scientists 
who need it and want to get more of it. We believe that as a government, as, as governments of the world, as the people of the world, there are missions that are at that level. Mars, going to the moon, Phobos Deimos, interesting asteroids on the way to Mars. That's where we want to see NASA go. That's where we want to see our government go. That's where we want to see the big, grand things happen. On the way there, we want to be doing our plans, which is filling up what we call free space with lots of neat things going on, including the expanding the uh, community of human life. Now, if we don't do it right, this is where we're going to end up. Um, we know we are dealing with a dysfunctional body, um, and it's probably more risky to the human race than some of the things coming at us from space. Um, luckily, they can't pull it together, as we're going to hear about later on probably today. But this is what's out there. This is what we're going to have to deal with if we don't do what we're doing at this meeting the right way. But I believe if we as a community can unite and do these things the right way and operate in a way where we raise all boats and everybody gets what they need and works in a way that is cooperative and aimed at the goals that we all share, and we do all share the same goals, we can achieve amazing and magnificent things. Thank you. All right, thank you. OK, any uh, questions? We have one in the back. Yep. OK. Hey, Rick. Uh, so what's going to be the price of each scouting mission? I didn't what's going to be the price of each scouting mission? Of each scouting mission? Well, we believe that we can send the flybys, which are the fireflies, the small ones, for around $20 million. Uh, and we believe we can do the sample return for about $50 million. And apart from being a lot cooler to fly to an asteroid for a flyby, uh, what can't be done from the ground, observation-wise? You can't touch them. You can't touch them. You can't physically interact with them. I mean, it's important that we be able to look at these, uh, these objects, but the actual, for example, the porosity of the object, the actual makeup, the physical makeup. How, is this a gravel pile? Is it a tightly held, cohesive gravel pile? Is it a loose gravel pile? What occurs one meter under the surface? What kind of... Uh, what is the compositional difference between the surface and the depths within the asteroid? These are things that you have to get out there and poke around and, and uh, get involved with the asteroid to find out. And if you want to know more, I would suggest you talk to Dr. Morrison up here, who's the man. So. Okay, thanks. Other than John Lewis, who's the other man. Okay. Any well, other questions? Follow up on that question. You say the, a Firefly mission is 20. That's 20 million for your first three. What's the recurring cost if you want to send another three? Um, I can't get into a lot of it. There is a very interesting profit built into that, and that um, is a, includes the, the dropping cost as we begin to get from the first down to the second and third. They actually drop down, and then we hit production lines. Um, we can talk afterwards. We're a company. Just like my friend Chris, we're a company. We, we can talk afterwards. OK, any other questions? Any questions online? OK, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, so now we have a little bit of uh, discussion and synthesis. Um, Lindley, are you still online? Um, yeah, I'm still here, but I'm going to have to take about 10 minutes. Um, okay. You could uh, go ahead and um, start addressing the uh, list of questions that um, Pedro okay. has uh, uh, come up with, and uh, I'll be back with you in about 10. Okay, so uh, w when you come back, just let us know, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Um, if okay. could one of the, Pedro, do you want to just uh, read, read the questions? We or have, we have, we have them? Oh, we have them? Here. Okay. So. And, these are, uh, and these are directed to, to some of the presenters. Is that correct? So uh, if the presenters are still in the audience, they could help us answer these. Yeah. So we'll, uh, we'll go through these uh, just uh, one at a time. Um, okay. So this is from Ustreamer 911932 to Ray uh, Pickard. Uh, what is the ROM cost? Uh, number one, and number two, can you reach 10 microns uh, like NeoCam? Is is Ray? He's not. He's not on. Ray, are you online? Okay. Okay. So we'll 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 save that one for for later. For Gary Matthews, um, number one, how good is the astrometry from uh, USSS? 
And number two, what is the magnitude limit? Uh, the, the first part of the question from USS. What? Yeah, it's a USSS. Well, how good is the astrometry? Is the question. Uh, that would uh, let's see. That would probably space depend on the pointing. Um, so that would be done by the, the spacecraft. So um, I don't uh, I don't know. And then I we I haven't looked at the uh, at how far magnitude you could go down, but uh, you know at 1.1 meters, uh, you know should should be able to go pretty far. Uh, at five microns, so. Okay. So not very, you know, probably not a very pleasing answer, so. Okay. And there's a question at the back. Let's yeah, see. let's, uh, we'll alternate, and uh, let me go through this, because this one uh, person had several questions for, okay. for several speakers, so we'll go through these. Hmm. We'll alternate, we'll go through the room and come back and forth. Um, this is for, uh, same questioner uh, for Bijan uh, this time. Uh, Bijan, uh, does the LADAR need pre-discovered objects or can it survey? That's number one. And how many per year come within uh, 0.4 uh, lunar distances? Or 40 lunar distances, I think there's a typo there. Okay. O4 LD. Is this on? Okay. Uh, I can certainly um, answer the first one. The LADAR is not a great way to detect them for the first time. What you want to do is know where to point. And that question got raised before uh, as well. And that's why the uh, the synthetic tracking is is, is you know what is uh, what we recommend to do, which is to you know use a passive detection system, and that will very efficiently find them, um, and it will also do enough astrometry um, so that you can point properly. Like if you have a four meter telescope with a two micron laser, that's a hundred milli arc second beam, you want to point to about a fifth of that lambda over d, so to about uh, tw twenty milli arc seconds. So if you had like 10 milli arc second class pointing, uh, I mean astrometry, you're in good shape and synthetic tracking can, can do that. Uh, so LADAR is great for ranging and sizing and imaging, uh, laser radar, but, um, uh, but, the, but for detection, you really wanna know where you're pointing first. Right. Okay. Uh, and then this is uh, for S uh, Stefan Kleen. Uh, what magnitude limit can these star trackers reach? I think this was asked. And how many objects per year are bright enough to detect? Is Stefan still in the room? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, don't, I don't have the answers to that. Okay. Sure. Uh, and then we'll, um, if we can go to the, in the room at the top. Sorry, can you get the back? Mm -hmm. A lot of the presentations that we had seem to map one across the other. Um, either technologies that connect or that could mesh together um, for solutions. Have they been mapped in any way? Has there been some sort of representation of where they, they plot together or not yet? Sorry, can you repeat that? In terms of mapping, in terms of the organization of the, of the or have they actually been mapped? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think maybe the terminology is misleading, mapping or not. I, I guess the question is, these technologies seem to kind of connect together, they might actually kind of come together in, in terms of a, of a bigger solution set. Has that work of kind of analyzing how they might fit together or visualizing how they might fit together been done? Not yet. I mean, that's one of the, the things that, that um, we're working on. Um, if you notice the way we tried to structure the, the talks, they were trying to group in, in, in topic areas. Absolutely. Um, so, um, so it was a good observation on your part. Um, that's part of the process that we'll, we'll do right now um, right. is, you know, after hearing the talks, hearing some of the presentations, go back and, and have a, a talk, and then we'll, we'll take that next step. Let's go to, uh, Paul, why don't you read the uh, next one, and I will pick out next speakers for, in the room. So from, a question online. Uh, from Nick Howe's Fox Telescope for Clinton Clark. Is he here? Yes. Uh, the question is, have you investigated the possibility of doing starfield subtraction? for a crowded star field taking a known reference star field frame and then using subtractive methods to identify moving objects? Uh, short answer is yes. Um, and so there, there's pros and cons to, the, to that approach versus our approach. Uh, we probably don't want to go into here, but the short answer is yes, we've looked at it. Okay. Uh, our approach is near optimal, uh, which again, we, too much to get into what that means in terms of physics, but uh, we've looked at it. Okay, okay. Right. very good. Okay, questions in the room? Let's, like, let's okay. go this one, Chris. Chris, right here. 
So I think Lindley mentioned this at the uh, the intro that uh, there was a, a population of people who are not represented in today's session, and those are all the professionals who are who are currently doing the work, uh, the uh, all the different surveys, whether they're ground based or space based, and. Over the last 10 years, that has been progressing towards larger pieces of glass and more professionals as the, as the task gets more and more difficult. Um, this is just an open question. Is, is the objective in find all asteroids and those that may pose threats to Earth and know what to do about them? Um, the, there is a, there's a mindset that could go in creating the, the single best way to do that or trying to find the absolute lowest cost broadest way to do that and the what what do you think it is that uh, will try to be optimized in that and do we want is NASA looking for the solution which kind of leverages stuff that's already out there or are we trying to figure out if that's insufficient and something new needs to be created I, I Lindley uh, is it should really answer that mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I'm gonna defer it a little bit mm -hmm. to him but I think one of the reasons why we're having this this workshop is to consider other alternatives uh, that's not to say that we are going to um, stop with the, the professional or, or the current existing assets that we have to look and, and detect uh, and find asteroids and observe those asteroids. Um, but as you know, there's a variety of techniques, there's a variety of, of different ways of doing things. Um, even within our own uh, professional community, we have different ways of, of doing things and detecting asteroids and characterizing them. So I think one of the things about this workshop is that we are looking for those new ideas. We specifically did not have people come in who we're very familiar with. We know their, their uh, techniques. We know their assets very, very well. We work with them on a constant basis. We're more interested in getting new ideas, uh, opening up the, the trade space, as you will, and trying to see if there's anything that we can leverage that maybe we haven't had before. And so perhaps we could throw that question to the audience. This is not a uh, forum in which we should provide the answers. It's, this is a discussion forum. So uh, if anyone would like suggested answers to that, um, please feel free. Um, we have one here, one here, yeah. and we can go back online. Okay. Uh, just to jump into that, I I would say in the uh, particularly in the partnership participatory engagement, the the effort really is to um, to throw this out and get uh, as many ideas that we haven't thought about and engage in a conversation that says. Here's, here's state of the art right now. Can we improve on that? Um, it, additionally, are there other ideas that we haven't even considered yet? And can we leverage resources to enable us to accelerate on, on the state of the art right now? So from my perspective in, in the grand challenge, uh, the, the, the goal really is to start to figure out what we don't know and uh, figure out where the trade spaces are to accelerate the work by bringing in uh, people into the conversation that we haven't had yet. So certainly in the grand challenge perspective, it is see where we are, we have a sense of where we want to go, where are the gaps, and are there ways that we can creatively leverage to fill those gaps um, to achieve our goal. And, and we can certainly talk some more. And one down here, please. Hi, this is Dave Morrison speaking. Uh, I think this has been a great session, and the whole idea of using the RFI to get new ideas is great. But I would also say that I often found myself not really understanding what issue individual speakers were directing. Uh, there is discovery, and there, the bar is very high. We have found more than 10,000 near-Earth asteroids. We're finding them at the rate of several a day. There are a lot of professional astronomers involved. That doesn't mean there's no possibility for, for new techniques, but, but the bar is high. And you have to ask these folks uh, with particular ideas if they've done anything to test them or their capability. Second is characterization of orbits, astrometry, tracking where you already have the object found, you already know at least approximately where it is, and I think there were a lot of interesting ideas presented for that, like, like Jane Lou's LIDAR. Um, and then finally, there is the physical characterization, and while there were a number of ideas presented, I often find myself wondering what question is proposed to be answered, 
Uh, just going there and taking a picture is not enough. Several people talked about infrared, and in some cases, I was not clear whether they were talking about reflected solar infrared, which allows you to characterize the, uh, the makeup of the, of the mineralogy of the surface, or thermal infrared, which allows you to determine size. And so I just wonder how we do the next step. The ideas, many of them were very stimulating, but they left many open questions as to what really is intended and what prop specifically, what problem each speaker was going to solve. Chris. Yes. Go ahead. So just to put a bookend on my uh, original comment, I, I think as NASA may expand and consider a variety of options, uh, to date it's been mostly self-organizing in terms of the professionals who have brought capability to the table and um, identifying what they think is best to do and how they think they can best contribute with the resources they have. I think as NASA casts a wider net, in addition to prioritizing things that you know, they see as important by providing funding for it, I think there also is a responsibility within the agency to actually uh, create a capability to m more directly tell people the specific thing that they believe the new identified capability should be doing. It should be you know, looking in this area of the sky, it should be optimizing this measurement uh, because we're interested in a particular result. Uh, that leads to you know, NASA's interests and uh, you know, the broader interests of the entire enterprise. And that's something that I think uh, as it, uh, you know, from uh, photographic plates and markers to CCD astronomy to uh, some pretty high tech stuff, high tech stuff going on today, uh, there's still a long way to go to be complete uh, and to satisfy the challenge and I think it's gonna require a, a bigger office at NASA to, uh, to uh, manage it all. Thanks for your comments. Okay. So I thought we may have a question. We we only got one mic runner. So are you back, Lindley? I'm, yeah, I'm back with you now. Good. Would you like to re-ask your question, <laughs> Chris? <laughs> all right, all right, we're done. Carry on. So um, I was going to ask a question, to Clinton, but first I can answer that question about how many asteroids would come within range of laser radar. That's about 20 or 25 a month. Thank within you. 40 lunar distances, right? And um, you were saying that the software is fully automatic, but surely there has to be somebody sitting there so that when something is detected, somebody decides whether it's interesting to follow up or not. Yes. So just a moment. So I guess my question is, what's the level of interaction required? Sure. So in general, when we operate it today, we are looking for man-made spacecraft. Uh, we operate it one of two ways. One is where there is an operator uh, at the controls in our office in Manhattan Beach, and the software has audio and visual cues for any anomalies, whether it's a uncue detection or unusual photometry or whatever it might be. Uh, it'll beep. It'll uh, it'll turn an image red. It'll do something to cue you to look. Uh, we can also set it up to run autonomously if we wanted to just cue another sensor. So let's say we got uh, an anomalous photometric reading and we don't know why. We could have it autonomously cue another sensor in our network to look at it and get some angle diversity and verify is something really going on or did we, you know, the cloud fly through if, if there wasn't an operator there to verify something like that. So it operates in both modes. If we were doing post-processing of historic data, for example, it wouldn't make sense to have an operator necessarily sitting there. It would just uh, pull out all the the, uh, we have what we would call a detection file. It would, put all, it would just be a printout of all the activities, and it would have some cue in there as these are the interesting lines and the output. You need to go uh, take a look at it, and if you want to go back and relook at the, the imagery, you could rerun it, and it would load it into the simulated sky at that point in time so you could get the context of it flying like you were in front of it, but you wouldn't have to be there uh, while it was processing. I hope that answers. Does that? Yeah. And, and you guys keep all the raw data? that you take? From our telescopes, yes. We have all the raw. I uh, wanted to kind of build on uh, Dr. Morrison's comments. They, one of the purposes I think that is magnificent about something like this is expanding the level, depth, 
and breadth of participation beyond the usual players. What happens is, uh, uh, you know, unlike, uh, well, unlike Mars, which is not potentially going to kill us at some moment or produce grand new wealth, uh, you know, which is where Lewicki and I live, um, this is something that should concern us and has a tendency to be turned on and off based on, um, you know, an impact or, or something like that or a near miss or something like that. So by creating an ongoing interactive conversation with as wide an audience as possible, and yes, we all may make each other a little bit crazy depending on what our level of knowledge is or understanding, and there's a lot of patience called for in all sectors. But by doing that, what we are going to be doing is in a, in a sense creating both the professional army and the citizen army that can be deployed to, to protect the planet. And, and that's an incredible thing. And I think if you guys can continue to refine this and don't let this be a blip, let this be the beginning of something that grows and grows, uh, we can move from that archetypal, uh, how many books were in, about asteroids, you know, start with the number of people looking for asteroids is less than one shift at a McDonald's. You know, that's the cliche. If we can, you know, change that dramatically, I think we can do a lot. And you guys should be commended for that. I think we've moved beyond that now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're a little bit back. Oh, three, McDonald's. three McDonald's. Three McDonald's. <laughs> two McDonald's. Three McDonald's. Okay. Hey, any other uh, comments? Just one more go back about um, the uh, the idea of, of uh, determining areas of focus. Uh, really, this is uh, particularly in the grand challenge a first step towards uh, communicating with the community. And we recognize we're, we're communicating with a community that we know to some degree, and we expect to expand more broadly. Uh, inherent in the grand challenge side of things is the idea that we're not going to dictate what the requirements need to be uh, and, and do that on our own, that rather it's a co-creative process. So. We're beginning that effort and really look forward to not determining how this should look, but rather do it together because we're not going to own it ourselves. This is going to be a group effort. And so uh, at this point, we are a bit vague. Um, it is grand, uh, but the purpose is to begin the conversation so that we can uh, determine what the requirements are going to be together so that we can agree on uh, and have that shared understanding that allows us to, to share that work. So uh, hopefully that clarifies a little bit more, Chris, the, the, uh, where we're, we're, we're coming from on that. I just wanted to say, tomorrow afternoon, we'll be discussing this in, a, in another session, so we can uh, con continue this debate then. Yeah. Any other uh, questions from uh, inside the room? Discussion? Thought we had one over here? Yeah. Is there, is there <laughs> something want to do this one? Uh, we have, we do we have. Should, we should ask Lindley. Yeah, Lindley, Lindley, uh, Lindley we want to give you an opportunity to to say something if you'd like, if you're still online. Yeah, I'm still here uh, trying to uh, <clears throat> manage some things for anticipated shutdown, unfortunately. Uh, well, I really appreciate all the presentations today. Uh, we um, uh, got a pretty broad uh, brush of uh, all the different uh, areas uh, technologies and techniques uh, that can be used uh, for asteroid detection and characterization. Um, uh, it, uh, it really is uh, uh, a, a very large er area of endeavor, and there's a lot of ways that uh, capabilities and resources can be brought to bear to, uh, to accomplish it. Uh, and so that kind of gets us back to why we're why we're all here um, uh, in trying to I I explore uh, where 
some more contribution can come to the effort that we've had going for, for quite a while. Uh, I think we saw some, some good ideas here, some things that need further exploration. Um, I think we saw some things that uh, maybe need a little more thought and, and uh, a little more uh, experience uh, at uh, what it really takes for asteroid uh, detection and observation characterization uh, to see how they might better apply. Um, as to where we go from here, uh, we're uh, taking this information and uh, it'll take us a while to digest it all, of course. Uh, we'll be putting some thoughts together for the plenary on Wednesday morning. Uh, as to uh, where we uh, what we saw and where we think uh, that takes us and what some some of the ideas and concepts might be that uh, uh, we will look uh, want to look further into. Um, however, I'd also uh, would say to um, most of the presen presenters here, uh, uh, if you're international, uh, the opportunity isn't quite as open to you, but a lot of these ideas uh, that were talked about today are things uh, that could certainly be proposed uh, to the Near-Earth Object Observation Program uh, in our, our next um, uh, solicitation cycle. Uh, uh, so uh, be thinking about that. Uh, um, in putting a proposal into NASA uh, for uh, your ideas and concepts and what you pr what you propose, um, I don't think I have anything uh, else uh, further to say at this time. Uh, Paul, the Pauls, <laughs> and I will uh, will get together and and uh, talk about. Uh, uh, what we want to uh, present uh, Wednesday morning to kind of summarize uh, what we saw today. Uh, but um, uh, are there any other uh, questions or, or issues? Um, or um, also turn it back to the, the two Pauls to uh, uh, make any comments they'd like. Okay. Um, no, I agree. I think this has been a, a great yeah. Great session. Um, I really appreciate everybody's time and effort, um, especially uh, the presenters. I think we've got some really good, interesting ideas, and, and we need to go and, and look at those. And as Lindley said, um, we'll gather and, and get back and, and present some of our preliminary uh, findings on, on Wednesday morning. Um, we, did, we do have some more questions. We do have another one on, uh, online, Lindley, that we'll, we'll read out, and then we have a few more comments in the room. Actually, this, this sure, is... we have about 15 minutes more, uh, more here yep. that we can uh, address things. Yep. We have a suggestion online from um, Mike3cap.sub, uh, underscore sub, a wiki containing all the information currently known about asteroids would be tremendous. And this is a, a participatory uh, technique that we could use to, uh, to ensure that, to engage everyone and, uh, and continue the discussion. So that's, that's a very good one. There's a second one okay. here. Okay, um, let's go to David. We have one more, and then we'll have a couple more on the um, online. Lindley, this is partly for you from Dave Morrison, because I think you were out when I spoke before. The question I keep coming to is not, are these good ideas? Many of them are, and they're about hardware and software and approaches, is in each case, what problem is this going to address or solve? Well, if you'd address that to me, uh, I, I think that for each of these uh, techniques uh, uh, that were talked about today, um, uh, we can see uh, where uh, it could be applied uh, to um, either detection, uh, orbit determination, or uh, object, uh, you know, physical characterization uh, parameters of of, uh, of an object. Um, uh, we can um, uh, stand improvement in, in all those areas. I think uh, uh, I don't think we have a 
a, a lock on any particular area. Um, I, I agree that the presenters may have been a little uh, vague and uncertain about exactly uh, where they uh, um, may have fit in, but I think part of that is just uh, them being new to the new to the arena and not uh, uh, having the the background that uh, uh, some of the rest of us do. That's very good. Chris. Uh, so I think this is another question for uh, Lindley. This is uh, Chris Lewicki, and I'll channel my best Don Yeomans and talk about the top three priorities uh, in um, asteroid work, the first one being find them, second one being find them, and the third one being find them before they find us. Uh, and uh, essentially the effort that we have put in to detection has been precisely consistent with that. And three, four years ago when uh, Flexible Path rolled out and we – uh, as a nation wanted to pursue asteroids to send humans to them, uh, it didn't take too long to retreat from that because we didn't have enough targets. And it wasn't quite clear that there was actually a response to try and improve that uh, in a meaningful way. And I see it again here in just the last few months with uh, considering the ARM option where uh, the idea in part of bringing something back near to the Earth was for uh, the potential opportunity to learn from a resource potential. But here again, we have not put the investment into knowing the types of these things so much as we have. We, of course, can't do that before we find them. So my, my question with all of that context is, how is it that we can sufficiently raise the priority of physical character characterization uh, such that when the opportunity comes up, we have a list of things to pick from? Uh, it's something that there are the resources out there to do it. Uh, they certainly exist all over the planet. They just haven't really been given this sufficient priority and this purpose to go off and create this data set. And that's something at Planetary Resources, I'm, I'm interested in how, in t how to incentivize that uh, from outside the system uh, so that we, we have you know, more than just a few things that are spacecraft targets that have characterization like JU-3 and uh, RQ-36. Well, my answer to that is that uh, whether you're an existing asset, uh, a resource that could be used, or uh, whether you're a concept that that's, uh, uh, could be very valuable to the effort, it, it all takes funding. Um, uh, Nobody can can operate uh, on uh, on thin air. Um, uh, the, the the better, the greater the capability. You know, the more uh, backing that it that it that it takes. And um, uh, I sort of agree with you that we're not going to uh, accomplish this by, you know, uh, you know, throwing $20 million at it. Uh, it is something that, that does take a more um, focused and, and concerted effort uh, to accomplish. Uh, I, I think with the Asteroid Initiative, what the agency is trying to do is, is enlist um, uh, other uh, uh, players, other part uh, partners uh, around the world in the effort, so that the agency doesn't have to fund it all. Um, whether or not that will be uh, a successful uh, uh, way of accomplishing that, we're we're have to see. Okay, uh, but. Um, yeah, to find uh, to find a better part of the population, and particularly those uh, that are, you know, an order of magnitude smaller than than what we were attempting before, is uh, uh, you know, it takes resources. Yeah. I'd like to make a comment that you know one can uh, even in the maybe time of this workshop put some uh, numbers around this. Um, 
if we just take the example of detection through synthetic tracking, uh, you know, laser laser uh, radar is going to cost millions of dollars for an, for well maybe a, a couple to three million dollars for a minimal system, but synthetic tracking that the other part the detection, uh, a minimal system is uh, a high speed uh, camera. Um, at the back end of a, uh, a fast uh, telescope. Uh, and you, starting from the one meter class telescope, uh, if you can design a optics in the back end for, it would be in the, you know, on the ten, 10 to 20, you know, depending on what you're doing, the thousand dollar class, you know, set of optics in the back end um, of, a, of a, you know, big tele one meter telescope. Then uh, the the the, uh, the cameras, these cameras that we're talking about, are in the twenty, thirty thousand dollar range. Um, in the end, you really want a lot of etendu, you know, a omega, um, a a aperture times uh, solid angle, and so it's not within outside the reach of the smaller facilities um, uh, to 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 do that detection. Um, and be sensitive to uh, you know a large number of asteroids by using the technology. Um, I, I should just put a plug in that that uh, at Astro PH, we just uh, submitted a paper to Astrophysical Journal, but it's it's right now for free on archive uh, that describes how basically you know our approach to doing this, and this is uh, something that can scale to to much smaller telescopes on the scale of less than a hundred thousand dollars. It's still not peanuts. But it's it's much more accessible than millions of dollars. We've had another Ustream question that is basically along these lines, the, um, and I'll quote: uh, "The question that hasn't been addressed is scale. How many NEOs per year need to have their orbits, rotation periods, and compositions determined? Discoveries are now a thousand per year, and soon to be two thousand per year, soon. But characterization is only about a hundred per year. So." Um, there's a mismatch going on here. Um, and I would comment that, uh, first of all, the, the, uh, we, we can't fight these, uh, um, those statistics. Even so, radar observations are going up, IR observations are going up. So these are the, the two, or two of the uh, key um, uh, uh, sources of, of characterization. Um, IR in particular, if we can, if we can boost that with, with space-based IR, I think that would be a great way to continue the characterization and, and make a, a dent in the large numbers here. And we have a question at the back. Comment. Actually, I was going to make a comment about IR. I'm part of a proposal that is probably sitting on Lindley's desk <laughs> uh, to use the two meter at Kitt Peak, yeah. proposing for 50% yep. time. And that should give us a um, spectra of, I think it's 1,500 to 2,000 a year. And if anybody wants to chip in for the other 50%, then we can double the rate. And it's very cheap. It'd be like 300 million a year. I'm not going to sell anything else. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so there's, and you, and when you're saying spectra, what, what type of spectra are you talking about? Yeah. With wavelength range, just. Sorry, um, I can't remember the numbers right now. I can tell you later. Okay, that's fine. We'll but talk later. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let me ad address the question a little bit. Um, although, uh, you know, we're finding. Uh, a thousand, uh, a couple of thousand of these objects a year. Um, you, you don't have to characterize everything that uh, is found. Um, we uh, want to characterize those that are of interest. And uh, those that are of interest are, you know, first of all, those that that may uh, pose a, an impact hazard to the Earth, and that's maybe, you know, ten to fifteen percent. Of that of that population that have uh, any uh, possibility of, of impacting the Earth, uh, most of them are in, are in very benign orbits, um, and and then those that uh, uh, would represent a good uh, target destination for either a robotic or, or human exploration, which is even a smaller subset uh, of that of that population. So I'm not too worried that the characterization capability uh, legs uh, quite a bit behind the, the uh, detection capability because you simply don't need to characterize every rock and rubble pile out there.
Okay, we have another question in, in the room. Okay. Um, we've talked about uh, space-based IR. What about aircraft-based IR? I know that the Sophia aircraft was uh, based out of Christchurch here about two months ago flying missions over toward Antarctica. So I don't know if there's consideration for using that aircraft quite a bit as far as, you know, for characterizations and detections and such. Right. That's a good point. I, it's good. Yeah, it's something I think that we look into. Uh, the uh, the Sophia spacecraft or sorry, aircraft is also being utilized by other other people as well, and they have other other projects. So it's a question of um, prioritizing and seeing what we can do in terms of sequencing, getting everything together. Yes, uh, again in the top. Quick question, actually, is a question rather than an answer. Um, for thermal IR, there, there's a new Neowise paper out, um, and and I was looking at a plot that showed that below 50 meters, they have very few. Uh, that they saw even during cold, uh, during the cold regime. So the question is, um, of, you know, certainly of anything of interest to ARM, uh, you know, if we're going to go below 50 meters, we're probably below 10 meters. And so in that class, is, does thermal IR have a chance? Um, and I, I don't actually have the answer to that. I just um, the observation that Neowise didn't even come close to reaching it. Lindley, do you uh, have a comment, or I can? Well, first of all, Neowise is a very limited capability. Uh, it was designed even to uh, even detect asteroids in the first place. Uh, we adapted it to that to that purpose. Um, you know, it uh, has a uh, relatively small aperture and uh, a very narrow uh, uh, field of field of regard. Um, uh, so that's why uh, it uh, didn't detect uh, all that many asteroids, and certainly not uh, not small ones. Um, but one thing it is uh, valuable for in in this uh, uh, looking at targets for ARM is that uh, it can help us narrow the envelope on a particular object on what its size might be. Uh, in other words, uh, if there's an object that we're interested in, in trying to find out its size and we uh, determine that it did pass through the Neowise field of view at one point, you know, based on that orbit, we can determine whether uh, what size it has to be, to be to have been detectable by Neowise. And if it's not detected by Neowise, then we know it's smaller than that. So. Um, uh, you know, there are things like that, tricks like that that you play when your overall capability is, uh, is limited. All right. I think uh, with that, we will call it a wrap. Thank you very, very much for all the input. And uh, we will hopefully see you uh, tomorrow morning. Thank you.